The New York City subway, it's crowded, it's dirty, it's hot, and it's one of the most dynamic and exciting places in the world. Hi, I'm Michael Weitzner, and I've been an architect in New York City for over 35 years, and I've been riding the subway for over 40 years. Today, we're going to look at the architectural details in the oldest and newest subway stations in New York. First up, let's talk about one of the oldest subway stations, City Hall. When the subway opened in 1904, the City Hall station was one of the first of the 28 stations. It was the showpiece of the entire system. They created these grand vaults, almost like a cathedral, with these beautiful Romanesque arches that follow along the curve of the station. So each one of these vaults is made out of Guastavino tile, which is actually a terracotta tile that is structural, and it's a system of layers, and they're usually put in in a herringbone pattern, and they alternated the colors. And Guastavino tile is actually used in many places throughout New York City. One example is the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Station. Another example is the underside of the Queensborough Bridge at 59th Street. And the City Hall stop was so unique as the showpiece that not only did it have skylights, but it also had these beautiful brass chandeliers to give light underneath in a very decorated manner. So the City Hall station was closed down in 1945 because of this tight curve. The new longer trains couldn't make the turn. All the IRT subway stations were designed by Heinz and Lafarge, and obviously here at City Hall they created quite a masterpiece. But the typical station is much less ornate and is really stripped down and is much more about function and operation than it is about beauty and ornament. Okay, let's talk about a typical IRT subway station. So this image shows a 14th Street Express station when it first opened, and that's why it's so clean. What made New York City's subway system unique from other cities was that when they first built it, they included express tracks as well. No other city had that. And you can see the express track running beyond on the other side of these columns right here, where the local pulls into the station. Typically, you'd go down less than 18 feet to get to the platform, and then the tracks would be about three feet below that. Because they're so close to the surface, and the way that they get fresh air from the sidewalk above is you could actually hear the subway coming when you're walking along the sidewalk above. And the thing about these IRT stations is that they're extremely simple and they're all about just getting it done and getting it done quickly. So the way they built these stations was by a method called cut and cover. They cut a trench in the middle of the street less than 20 feet deep. So this is basically a cross section through the subway tunnel. The train would ride in here on its wheels. This would be the express track, the express track going in the opposite direction, and this again would be the local track here with another train. And then above, they would put in these columns, they would build the walls, they would lay down the track, and then above this tunnel, they would put in all the utilities, so the sewer lines and the water lines, the electrical lines that the city needs to run, and then on top of that, they would put the road. So here's where the building is, that's where a building is, here's the sidewalk, and then here's the road. So let's take a look at the 96th Street station along the 2nd Avenue line. And what distinguishes this station from one of the typical IRT stations that we just looked at is that there's no columns in it. Because it's tunneled, it's sort of self-supporting and it forms this one continuous vault. This was the city's first major subway expansion in over 50 years. It extended the Q line along 2nd Avenue to four different stations, 63rd Street, 72nd Street, 86th Street, and 96th Street. So this is how they dug out the 2nd Avenue tunnel. So if the street is here, and these are the buildings, what they did is they went really deep, and they tunneled all the way down here with giant drills and giant drill bits, which they actually leave at the end of the tunnel, they don't take it out. So it's still down there. And when they extend the 2nd Avenue subway up to 125th Street, they'll keep that same drill bit and it will stay then at the northern end of 125th Street. What distinguishes the 2nd Avenue subway from the other stations is that the platform is in the middle and the tracks are at the edge. And then there's a mezzanine where people walk up here and up here and it's open to the curved ceiling of what was the tunnel. So a person standing here can look down to the platform there, and then the stairs come down here, and here's the subway. And you get this double height space, which is very nice. So one thing that distinguishes the New York City subway is it's super loud, because it doesn't run on rubber wheels like a lot of other cities subway lines do. And Second Avenue, they made a determined effort to make it a lot quieter, and they included these acoustic panels, which would absorb a lot of those sounds. 
So the Second Avenue subway is much more humanistic. It's much brighter, it's much more open. It's not as dark, it's not as dingy as a lot of the other original subway stations are. So let's step back for a second and talk about the history of the subways. What prompted the subway to begin with was the great blizzard of 1888, believe it or not. At that time, New York had trolleys and it even had elevated trains that were started in the 1870s. But this blizzard paralyzed all of that travel. And not only that, but New York City also, electricity was relatively new. And all the wires were above ground and were put up in a very haphazard way. And they formed this almost solid web so that when all the snow came down, it took down all the wires with them. So what people don't always realize is that putting all the electrical power below ground happened at the same time as putting the subways underground. Okay, so let's take a look at the iconic New York City subway map. So what jumps out at me about this early IRT map is that in red, it shows the actual subway lines, of which there are not many, but they do go to Brooklyn and they do go to Queens. And these blue lines are actually the elevated subways that still remained. And so earlier we were talking about City Hall and you could see that station right here, very close to the Brooklyn Bridge station, which is why in 1945, when they closed the City Hall station, it did not inconvenience many riders because Brooklyn Bridge station was so close. So let's take a look at the full map. So the MTA is a combination of three subway companies, the IRT, the BMT, and the IND. And that's why there's so many different letter designations and number designations and in fact, some of the subway cars are different sizes because they were all built at different times. So the system now has 26 lines and 472 stations. I mean, look at it. It's huge. Now let's take a look at some of the entrances into the New York City subway system. So when the IRT was first built, this is what the typical entrances looked like. And they're fantastic. They're the sort of Art Nouveau, very European influenced, compared to the new Second Avenue line, which also has its own great style of subway entrance with these beautiful glass canopies with the spider connections, what they're called. This glass is made out of safety glasses, which is the same glass that your windshield is made out of. Okay, so let's take a look at the design drawing for the IRT entrance kiosks. So the entrance kiosk has this sort of soft Art Nouveau dome-like roof, and the exit kiosk has a different kind of roof, which is this hip roof with the ribs exposed. Both are surrounded by ribbed wired glass. So if the glass shattered, it was held together by the wires. You can't talk about the New York City subway without talking about subway tile. This photograph shows the ubiquitous and eponymous subway tile that the New York City subway is famous for. So a subway tile is essentially a rectangular tile as opposed to a square tile. So this tile, the subway tile and a running bond has been there since the very beginning and it will probably be there until the very end. So the original 1904 stations have these beautiful mosaic tile names and others have these more elaborate bas-relief plaques. The original IRT contract had a clause in it that stated, all parts of the structure were exposed to public sight, shall be designed, constructed, and maintained with a view through the beauty of their appearances as well as their efficiency. And some of those stations have really beautiful mosaic tiles and some of them include terracotta tiles that have symbols on them that represent the local area. For instance, at Astor Place, named after Jacob Astor, he made his fortune in the fur business and so they show beavers as part of all the ornament. So in the 1970s, the MTA decided to use a universal vocabulary for all of their signage. They reached out to Massimo Vignelli, the famous graphic designer, and he designed these crisp and clear modern signage using the Helvetica typeface, which is still in use today. So as the New York City subway evolves, so does its signage. And now there are signs that let you know when the trains are coming, and there are TV screens on the wall that show different advertisements, as well as the subway maps. So if you look around, you can see all the layers of history at every single subway station. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the art in the Second Avenue subway. And this is a shot showing the mezzanine level, which is one level above the platform level. And you could see all these beautiful mosaic tiles that form these figures along the way that are extremely realistic. So this is a modern take on the subway art where it's more like a gallery and less about the ornamented tile work in the signage. And since 1985, the MTA has made a concerted effort to include artwork along the stations. And there's over 300 works of art in the subway. And some of those artists include Gene Shin, Vic Muniz, Chuck Close, 
and Sarah Z. Other world famous artists include Yoko Ono at 72nd Street by the Dakota and Roy Lichtenstein at the Times Square station. So those are the differences between the oldest subway stations and the newest ones. There's so much to talk about with the New York City subways that we don't have time for. The abandoned stations, the ticket booths, the lack of accessibility for people in wheelchairs, the track fires, the flooding, the rats, the loudspeakers that are always in disrepair, all the wonders of the MTA. If you want more videos about the New York City subway, please let us know in the comments below.